Sé que de lo bajo, sé que de lo bajo, o lo ami o ti de o yo sé que le. Hello and welcome to the Ashen Forge. I am Phantom X, joined as always by Diggs and the legendary Neurotoxin. Good evening. How are you guys evening. doing? Great. I uh, love good? that uh, Nero's wearing his glasses. Yeah, I was gonna say I love the shades. <laughs> well, I got a whole uh, whole matching thing here going on. Got the, the pants there too. <laughs> so. Uh, How's everybody? I guess I already asked that question. How's everybody doing? We um, have a lot of different stuff to talk about. There's, again, as, as sort of testing gets more available to discuss, there's a whole lot of different things that start popping up. So um, a couple of the things. So marketing, I think we were going to talk about military nodes, uh, where we're at within alpha testing, and of course, answering any questions you guys might have in chat. Um, about our testing experience, although I'm pretty sure most of you that watch us regularly are right there with us. So maybe not questions, but comments. That would also be, I think, fun to talk well, about. So actually, I do want to talk about something real fast because this week was kind of a funky one. So we tried the Thursday test. Uh, it was a little limiting because we weren't able to upgrade any of the nodes. So nobody could get their spears and staffs and their higher level equipment. If you can't get spears, well, it kind of sucks because spears are where it's at for you know most of the people, I think. Uh, on top of that, they attempted to do, uh, I'm not going to call it the impossible, but the perhaps inadvisable, which was try to patch the things that they found the problems with on Thursday and plan to run it again Friday morning. <clears throat> when they first... When, you know, when I first got up and got around to looking at stuff, they had pushed it from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Pacific time. And uh, when they got the patcher up, I got it all up and running. And it still hadn't finished patching by the time they said, you know what? We're throwing in the towel this time. Enjoy your weekend. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the not the inadvisable, it's trying to patch something and run it the next day with those fixes with an update that apparently wasn't uh it grooving very well with the uh the the launcher and well it happens it happens to the best of us we try our best but uh i i was a little maybe uh concerned about what the friday test would be like based on the results of the thursday test and sure enough we didn't have it no big deal. It's a learning experience. I'm sure they'll um, take it to heart this time. And I hope nobody had to stay late hours or come early hours to um, try to make the, the thing happen. Well, we've heard this sort of thing before, right? <clears throat> I think we always. Yeah. Why? Well, specific to, to development of landmark and pushing a new things forward before old, old things were fully Resolved, which is part of why I what I wanted to talk about as well. Um, you know, so those who haven't been testing, um, we were going to have two sessions. Had the f the first, I forget what day, Wednesday, and they were supposed to be Friday or I don't remember, but we ended up having one. And part of what came through, you know, things happen, server crashes. You know, it happens all the time. There there was a specific aim, um, and I believe it had something to do with AI with the server lag and rubber banding yeah. and stuff we were seeing the degradation yeah. of the server that's the thing they're continuing to believe yeah. that it's degradation of the server related to killing stuff and doing stuff and they're still it seems like they're still trying to narrow down exactly what it is so that way it can be um you know fixed up finally and resolved going forward to whatever extent they need for the current testing which is obviously what we should be doing but then um one thing that kind of came out within, I think it was Discord chat, Stephen kind of, I believe it might have been when they were announcing that they were not going to have the second testing. He had sort of mentioned that he made a call to put sieges or something related to sieges into the testing client um, in an effort to kind of push forward 
which kind of uh, made me kind of what? Um, you know, the, the idea of putting in something that big before you've <laughs> solved the current problem uh, seemed odd. And we did hear stories like that from Landmark where they would push things forward uh, before something was resolved. Um, I assume part of that is due to the video that was put out and still trying to make this uh, July, you know, deadline of having an alpha. And I assume that they think the expectation is that if, you know, once we start a no NDA alpha, that if they've been showing sieges with players, that part of the alpha testing will include sieges with players. And so I, I have to assume that's part of why that was pushed into the 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 build bef you know seemingly at an uh, inopportune time digs you're smirking i am keep finish finish your thoughts well, that's it i it just um i i don't you know we i i'm not a develop you two have been in that are in that or have been in that space i have not but you know we we all lived through landmark and sort of found out after the fact that through, through various people who worked on the game how the process typically was I was well, so I always base things on past experiences. So in this in this instance, the process was well, we hadn't fi finished the bugs of this deployment, but we were told to put something new in for the next deployment, and it sort of kept building up. And um, I'm not saying that's what they do here with Ashes all the time, but it felt similar to that uh, that they are trying to rush something out before major networking issues are are resolved. That's it. Um I mean, it's typical for, it, it, it's not uncommon for things to go wrong when you're making your new build. I mean, especially when you haven't had a lot of sleep. That's just something that happens. Um, and it's, you know, barely common. Um, but also we should expect that they're going to be having an, at least one new build per week because they are uh, on Scrum. And that means they're going to have weekly iterations. So they're going to have a new weekly build. And some stuff will be fixed and some stuff will not be fixed. And new stuff will be in for the new build. So that's just the way that works in general. Plus or minus um, if the branch that they're doing the weeklies on is the one that we're seeing or not. Yeah. Um, but, um, uh, and I think it's not. I think we have been a couple of iterations behind what they're currently uh using in-house um but uh uh what neuro was saying is going from thursday to friday and they're pushing us it was supposed to be every thursday but now they're moving us from weekly uh supposed to be weekly wednesday right it was supposed to be weekly wednesday and then the and now it's weekly fridays off. i believe yeah and so they're pushing us they're trying to push us to weekly friday um uh but um yeah, so going from Thursday to Friday, like Neuro said, is going to be a little bit more problematic. And then we're having sieges put in because if you remember, sieges were supposed to be the next phase of APOC. Um, and that was, what, a year ago that that was supposed to happen and they decided that it wasn't going to happen? Or is it two years ago? I want to say it was about a year ago when I was saying, sheesh, wake me up when we can fling things at walls and destroy them. <laughs> you know, and not not to be you know heckling, but more like that was the thing that was next up to show either APOC or otherwise that sieges would be yeah. the thing we see. So that's um, those, you know, as the pandemic was really starting to set in. So I'm sure that messed up a lot of the problem or the development well, process and threw they, things off. They stopped APOC before uh, the pandemic. But, they did. But. Um, so we so sieges were supposed to be the next thing, and then APOC ended anyway. Um, so there should be no surprise that they're going to be trying to put sieges in fairly quickly. But also, Stephen loves sieges. Yeah, um, he is a PvP -er at heart, and he gets to cheat. Yeah, except and he'll also get javelin to shit because he doesn't have the anti CC stuff built in yet. Yeah. Um, He's not a great player. Yeah, but uh, I, I uh, still say it's more from showing the video and then again trying to make this July. So, but go ahead. That, that's all. That's all part of the same thing. I mean, we've had he's been leading us through sieges every week 
since he opened up Alpha One preview. Um, he's just been doing it in small batches, uh, and I don't know what it, what the plan was for the Friday build in terms of opening it up more. Um, but I mean, there is a siege. He's been running people through the siege every week, so that part is not new. We shouldn't be surprised that he's going to be trying to get sieges in before um, uh, Alpha One officially starts. Um, and we shouldn't be surprised that he's going to, you know, try and get it in as fast as he can because he loves sieges. That's like his favorite thing to do. Yeah, but here's my yeah. thing: is we can't test uh, the original problems if the servers can't be up because you add something else big to it it's not like this was a little they added some cosmetic stuff i mean it's a big thing for sieges and uh, but they attack. already had they already had sieges in it's just been a very limited and curated sort of thing my take on it's actually that they are trying to use the sieges to narrow down and isolate what's causing the issues with the server degradation if it's something related to player activity and that if you aren't doing quests and you aren't killing enemies and you're just killing each other and potentially wrecking some walls if that gives them a different set of data that points to one thing or another that'll definitely help them you know track down and isolate the issues that have been causing the server degradation and the rubber banding and such so i think that was a little bit more of the intent this time is that they wanted to run sieges on every server so that way everybody would be able to have more of this concentrated battle where they're not really affecting the rest of the world server not really affecting any of the um the npcs very much except maybe trying to get a raid boss involved whatever extent that would be and i uh i think that was kind of the thing that they were they were hoping to do on friday was get more information but they seemingly had a lot of trouble with the build and the, the launcher and the updater and the servers and everything so just didn't happen but pe people have to Keep in mind that Steven is a gamer who is a first-time <laughs> game dev. So he's not used to all the pitfalls. And sometimes he overhypes and sometimes he's overeager. Um, and that's part of the transition of moving from being a gamer, being on production, and then realizing, oh, this is why we don't do this. Or, oh, this is why we don't say this. Because, you know. I don't know how much of it was exactly him, though. I... I I don't know how much of it was him and how much of it was a matter of um, trying to reach, you know, a consensus within the team before trying to do anything of that sort. That I don't know if there's other producers there that have the ability to tell them, hey, no, stop, don't do that. And likewise, I have been willing to say, yeah, all right, we can try to do a Friday thing after this Thursday thing. Sure. You know, we'll give it a best shot. And what's the worst that happens? We just call it off. Yeah, so like, what's uh, the doesn't doesn't he usually use the phrase about um, uh, shoot for the moon? And even if you miss, you'll still be among the stars. I think he said on the last stream. So, you know, that's that's fine. Yeah, we got to play on Thursday, so I'm good. By the way, if anything's funky, I think uh, one or all of our discords are collectively getting hammered a little bit, so um, we might be a little chunky, but yeah, you, we'll, you guys, uh, we'll keep on going regardless. Yeah, you guys keep on going. I think you, you we're going to mention something about military stuff, so I'm going to try to figure out if this is my end or if this is just Discord. Um, Check well, all your game so, downloaders. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, so uh, one of the big topics on the forums this past week was uh, the concept of champ for the arena uh, when determining the next mayor. So instead of having uh, everyone duke it out with uh, each other, each, each other's... Uh, uh, avatars to decide which player character becomes the next mayor. Um, they're thinking of having champions uh, stand in um, as combatants because um, it's rock, paper, scissors, and it's not really set up for 1v1 battles very well. So 
Um, I think that's a pretty cool idea because that if we have champions, I'm hoping and this is going to be one of my next questions for the next uh, live uh, dev live stream is whether these champions that we build up, assuming that they're humans and we'll be using the same classes or archetypes that we are. Um, could we also use these champions uh, scenarios for our freeholds to guard our freeholds and to guard our caravans? And if that's the case, that kind of builds up a lot of RP lore. Um, when we see these champions appear at a siege or at least appear at our freeholds or guarding a, 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 a caravan, that gives us more to talk about. We'll start to recognize these NPCs and um, it'll actually give us some emotional feedback when we see them on, on the field, even outside of the arena. So I'm hoping that we do get something like this. I suppose one of the other questions I have is how much detail and um, uh, specificity they're going to have, or if it's the champion is a very specific, like, NPC class and stat block, and most of what you're doing is giving them gear and maybe some other form of trophies or treasures that helps level them up in some way. Or if you would even be able to go out in the wild with them, like you were saying, with as a mercenary or someone that can help you out. Or if it's just a matter that you've got to have training facilities, and if they don't have training facilities, they're going to be a crappy champion. Yeah. It also makes me and wonder then, from how um, far and wide you'll be able to bring your champion if it's the sort of thing where, you know, you have to be somewhere in like an adjacent node to the region or if you can be training your, your secret champion way off in a far off land and suddenly when you show up, it's like, all right, here's my dude, and port over and it just beats everyone because we knew we were even existing. Well, but it's going to be in their arena setting. So I think uh, I also wonder, you know, how you're setting up matches. And one of the things I don't understand about it, because it seems like you would still kind of have the same problem at the end. Um, how would the mayor know what type of champion uh, to use or send in for the final battle? Um, so I don't know if the mayor champion would have to be his or their same um, archetype. I, I just, I, I, I don't know how that works. I, um, uh, yeah. I, uh, I also wonder uh, if the champion's even going to be uh, like a playable race if you're on and be able to pick your champions, for example, a monster that you've been able to tame in some way is it going to be like a Pokemon battle? And then the other question is it even going to be um, 1v1s or like scheduled matches, or is it simply going to be just everybody's plopped down in the arena with the champions? All right, and AI, go at it, and we'll see who's still standing. Yeah. Um, and then the other, the other option that people were talking about in the uh, forum thread was, uh, what if they're beasts? And I think that's the original question was maybe they should be beasts instead of humanoids. Um, and I mean, I think that's a little strange in terms of, I don't know, what you're fighting, um, what they want to be fighting. Uh, especially if they are already thinking about gear and things like that, it seems like it's more likely to be human avatars, uh, player race avatars. But uh, if we do get to have some beasts, then that gives animal husbandry maybe something more to do. Um, so that could be cool. Yeah. think about it yeah that would be uh, interesting to see um you know i i don't i guess i understand the reasoning um although I, when i always pictured military nodes i mean i i know that there's 
obviously certain builds would probably be better than others on a one by one, you know, one v one sort of scenario. Um, I always just assumed it would be player versus player. Um, so the idea of champions, I, I'm not a PVP or I would almost rather it just be player versus player. Um, you know, that would, so, that would I, I, again, I, I recognize maybe a tank versus a mage would be very one-sided in a certain way, but, but that's, that's the whole part of being top of the, the food chain, right? You're, I mean, you're supposed to, um, you're supposed to be the best. I mean, that's just how it's going to work uh, versus having your own champions. I mean, I could honestly care less. I won't be a part of a military node, but I guess how I had always viewed military was, was the best actual player by skill um, would be that mayor. You know, not who can control. I guess it's still skill, but um, yeah. I just never really viewed it as champions. The thing about the quote um, that we read, or I read offline, what did I say? There was um, taken from the wiki. You know, it said, as far as the champions, it says these champions can be equipped with gear and skills via quests, which I think makes total sense. You know, you're sending your champion out to succeed at something. They get something in reward. Makes makes sense from a military node perspective. But then it says, along with materials and gold to make the champion stronger. I don't think I would necessarily agree with the idea of gold and just throwing gold and materials at a champion. Uh, you know, this isn't a, an economic node. Um, this is a military node, so you shouldn't be able to just lump a million coin in and all of a sudden you're the best champion there is. Um, so I obviously it says this is all sort of a thought process, not an actual implementation. But um, again, something just didn't sit with that quote, just the idea of giving someone gold and, hey, they're better. Um, I don't know. That, that seems I don't know. It might represent the cost of training, but it might be that uh, the training, the materials for their equipment, and the quests that you uh, send them on are what it all amounts to. So it's not just a financial and resource game, but also, you know, management and upkeep over time. Make sure they're training the things that you want and need them to train. Yeah. And It'll be interesting to see how it all works out for sure. I'm, I'm, very intrigued you know theater elf says you know i think they're worried that one person will dominate but isn't that i guess in my head isn't that the point i mean you're, you're supposed to have one person dominate right that's the leader of the military node until someone can knock them off they are the leader yeah but it seems like if you know that you're going to be fighting a tank for sure then i don't know whatever is the uh paper to that rock should be able to defeat them. So you just send in a bunch of people, a bunch of people know in advance that they're going to use uh, whatever the paper build is to defeat the rock. And that and that yeah. might that might be, but that's a balancing issue for Intrepid. I mean, the, the, the fact is still it's whoever's the best playing the game. It should, you know, if, if it's, it's not, yeah. that means you're going to knock the person out each time because you're going to know if if it's a paper who's the mayor, then you choose your scissors as the champions. As, oh, no, I'm still or as your the, I'm, the I'm, most, I'm, not as the champ, not as the champions. But you know that it's going to be scissors, people who have a scissors build who are going to defeat whatever the paper well, build is. And that might be. But that that's a part of being a militaristic node. Um, and grumpy guy mentioned, you know, some people guilds will dominate. Yeah, they will. And then they should. That that's what's that's what eventually turns someone to say, I'm going to seed your node. Because, you know, you guys have ruled this forever because you are the top from a PvP perspective. And I don't like what you're doing. So now I'm going to get friends to knock you off. I mean, that, that's how it should work. It shouldn't be a best of pet battles. Yeah, but I th again, I think it's going to be easy to do. If I, if I know you're, you're a paper mayor, uh, just send in scissors, fighters. That's, again... Yeah why i'm thinking it might be more of a neutral archetype that the champion class uh consists of and that instead of it being a rock paper you. scissors it's i get you here's right. here's this thing and you customized it the way you customized right. it but there's going to be some similarities so it's not like a hard rock paper scissors sort of thing i get you, I get you. But, are, but are those champions going to be able to be used in a siege 
if you I sure uh, hope so. Again, again I'm hoping because if you can Are you use going to control them? If you can use not control them probably, but you can have mercenaries guarding your freeholds, you can have mercenaries guarding your caravan. So I'm hoping at least we can use them there. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if we can if we can use mercenaries for sieges, then I would hope these champions could be among them. I mean, because because again, in my mind, if you're the ruler of a military node, you should be the one that goes out and defends against the siege, not a champion of yours. It should be you. That's the whole point. It would be. It still would be you. Yeah. But it wouldn't you're because you're it? because you're using a, a, you're not using the skills that you have developed as a character in order to get to where you're at. You're using the skills of a of a uh, champion. Yeah, but- you're not displaying your as a character, you're not displaying your par- powers of a ca- as a character. Maybe as a player, but not as a character. You're displaying your your ability to control some other character. Does that make sense? Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't think we're. I don't. Are we running the avatar? Are we running that, or is it a mer- or is it like a mercenary? Yeah, that's a good question. Whether we're actually going to take remote control over of this uh, champion character, or yeah, if it's I'll- going to be. Maybe it's going to be more like a, a monster rancher sort of battle where you can give them commands and you can kind of tell them what sort of thing you want them to do, but they're going to execute it to the best of their abilities and training. Again, I'm not, yeah. I'm not even going to be a part of a military node because I don't want to. I'm not a PvP combatant person. I still feel very strongly that this should be a player versus player environment not a character not a champion that you've leveled i don't know something just doesn't sit right with how i initially envisioned these different I mean, types of nodes i it, to yeah. me a military node literally is the character that the, a player in, in their character that is able to defeat everyone else um and there might be balance issues and whatnot that what that, oh well there are are in real military life as well. So, I mean, it's that's just how it is. That's part of being a military-type node, not a pet battles node. Yep, and it's a very different, it's a very different um, vision, but I think I prefer the champions because that gives us more to talk about. It gives us more RP, it gives us more lore, um, and I would love to see these uh, but in champions a- as iconic characters. But in, out a, in the world in a player driven world of change having these play the players themselves would also become part of that lore and give you something to they talk will about. in any they will in any case sure so this is just icing on the cake um, I, I just it surprises me because of the uh, strength of conviction that Steven has for PvP and how it touches so many other areas of this game uh-huh. that the leader would not be chosen in a traditional PvP uh, situation. Yeah, but Steven's PvP focus is on uh, group PvP, not one versus one PvP. Well, so that's not super surprising. Well, maybe we just throw a couple groups in together and eventually one group has to turn on itself. So, <laughs> Or yield, submit. I do think if they're going to use champions, again, the idea of, of sending them out on quests or something, I mean, that just that makes sense and how you would strengthen your champion um, in order to compete. And, um, but I don't know. I still I still just always pictured it as the, you know, because it might be the asshole that always wins. And, and but that's but that's specifically what will entice someone to overthrow them. Um, you know, the, the person that stays on the throne for too long that you can't stand anymore. I mean, that's specifically what we're wanting to see happen. Um, you know, if, if you're, I don't know, I'd, I'll stop I think there. we'll be sieging for all kinds of reasons. So uh, I think we'll have plenty of reasons to siege. Yep. You know, you, you, um, you mentioned lore as part of this and i've actually been thinking about that you know how how that things will be presented here i've been watching a lot of videos on youtube of um just going over either game of thrones and just the sheer or lord of the rings and just the sheer amount of like lore and information that's out there um has has made me wonder exactly what we would get here 
um, again, being players will drive the world change as well. I just wonder how much, you know, how much very detailed backstory we get to sift through um, within that. Because I've always, again, also pictured this as, um, uh, as sort of the, the, the high fantasy Eve. You know, in Eve, you can write books about player lore, p players and groups of players that have done things. Yeah. And so that's how I've always pictured Ashes of Creation, that sort of... Obviously, you need some sort of starting lore and background for why things are like they are. Um, I don't know. That was more of an observation than a question. <laughs> so. It's yeah. definitely a game that lends itself to having more of the player story to it than, hey, look, everyone's the hero and everybody has the same quests they do because it's a sandbox. Theme Which park? Is, theme park. Uh, theme park, excuse me. Well, I mean, a sandbox is also very much like, all right, you're in a world, here's some tools, have fun. You can write a story if you want, but, you know, you have the, the world changes that you affect are just the ones that you've done yourself. It's not not in the context of, you know, everyone else to a greater or lesser degree, unless it's actually an RP server. Which I kind of would like to see them do RP servers, like a forced RP sort of thing, but... Um, who knows if people will actually buy it on that or not. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the other thing I also did want to kind of talk about in sort of broad strokes, because um, there was even actually, uh, now that I think about us talking about the forums beforehand, there was a, a Star Citizen post that always seems to come up, but um, there was a marketing tweet, you know, so for people who don't know, I, well, I assume everyone knows, but Stephen has his own Twitter uh, in addition to the Ashes of Creation, and often posts just as interesting, if not more, stuff there than the official Ashes of Creation. Um, so you should definitely follow him as well. But I think his last tweet was um, a mention of meeting with marketing, and they showed some physical um, products or you know uh, items that they were looking at creating and selling. That always just raises this question. You know, we've talked a lot about the the item store for in-game cosmetics, but um, it always raises the question of how is there a too far when you don't even have a functioning alpha yet when it comes to raising money through sales like this? And I, I think it's different, though. I, I guess the more I think about it, there is a difference between in-game items that you may or may not get and actual physical products you know, I have a, a well, a shirt. I think Diggs, you said you have some hoodies. Um, they so they had have, have sold physical products in the past. They had stopped that probably, gosh, what a year or two years ago now. It's been a while since they've done that. But do you have any thoughts on you know, is there is is there a too far or is it just you know you got to build raise money to build a game? I uh, didn't think of it in terms of too far. I kind of like some merch um i do like that uh a corvid um uh i forget what they call it castigator or the, yeah the corvid castigator um i would get that plushie um i was thinking because the question was what kind of stuff would you like to see um i think that was the question i saw on twitter um and i was immediately thinking of the um the dragon hats that we got from SOE back in the day. Yep, um, I fun. would get something like that uh, if they had it and wear it on the live stream. Off um, maps. On, yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's stuff that I would probably buy. I was, you know, I haven't gotten into fun, uh, Funko, Funko Pop. Yeah. Um, I haven't bought any yet. Uh, but these plushies that we saw kind of remind me of that. And I could see maybe having a collection, uh, maybe trying to set something up behind me for the Ashen Forge when we stream the show. I mean, sure. Yeah, no, I, I definitely I get that. I mean, for me, I always think of, you know, back when conventions were still a thing back in the old times. Um, the sort of things you would see flasks and mugs and shirts potentially other attire 
various sizes of plush toys, like the you know the Nagafen hat, or just you know various big and small plushes, uh, keychains, pins, stickers, convention lanyards. Um, one of the ones I brought up in my response was this very hilarious thing that Lawbreakers just had some desk they broke up and um, they put their logo and Snapchat thing on it. I think Lawbreakers is long since uh, dead, like two, three years ago. But it was funny. It's like, great, you're just leaving all these sharp weapons around E3. That's like, that's brilliant. Nobody's going to get in trouble for that. No, because some of the responses I've seen, you know, some of the responses were just, um, you know, that there are a lot of folks out there in the MMORPG community that sort of dislike this nickel and dime, you know, years out from actually having a a game, which I understand. You know, we have some very good examples. Um, You know, Star Citizen being obviously the first, um, although I, I guess the longer it goes and the more updates that come from it, the less it's sort of, obviously we've probably not seen anything mainstream about it probably in, I don't know, a year. Um, uh, when you it's, know, uh, it's about, it's, um, well, I mean about people complaining, like it's, it's, it's not been in any sort of gaming news for a while. And I have to think that's because it is, you know, it's still progressing. It's still moving forward and then you have the 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 sort of chronicle of Illyria's that sell a lot of stuff and just didn't happen um i think with star citizen it's definitely the fault of um the inverse of what snipe hunter would refer to which his was verisimilitude over veracity you get things that feel like you're doing the activity but that you don't need to be like a real world metallurgist to smelt metal and, you know, a real world blacksmith to hammer the blade in just the right way to get exactly what you're looking for. It's the opposite with Star Citizen. Their veracity over verisimilitude. They're so proud of their realistic looking graphics engine. They're so proud of their physics, as broken and wonky as it is. And they're just gonna keep on going till it's eventually released. Meanwhile, Elite has just been building and building and building. And with their most recent one, Odyssey, they've basically overtaken all of Star Citizen, like all the features that were expected for launch and release. And it's been good this entire time, and it's still going to be good. Uh, They're still just going up from up from here. Um, I know a lot of people were upset that it didn't necessarily meet all of the goals that they had set out for Odyssey, but not having followed that, I've been watching people play it recently. It's like, hot damn, that that really out Star Citizen, Star Citizen, and they didn't have to do it with a crappy product limping along this whole time and selling, uh, you know, two hundred fifty dollars ships that you're probably not going to get to play anytime soon. Is that Elite Dangerous? Yeah, Elite Dangerous Odyssey uh-huh. is yeah. the. Uh, Someone yeah. was just mentioning today in the forums of that, about that. Uh, there was a question, is uh, is uh, Ashes of Creation the next Star Citizen? And someone was saying that they, um, they supported uh, Star Citizen, uh, I guess Elite Dangerous, and definitely uh, Dual Universe. And uh, they, if they knew now, if they knew then and what they know now, they would not have backed Star Citizen. Elite Dangerous is giving them every, everything they ever wanted, and they like Dual Universe because it's voxel-based. Um, yeah, dual, dual Universe is landmark with spaceships, not people building cool spaceships, like actual fly-the-damn things. It's like, I guess, landmark meets uh, Kerbal Space Program, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, it seems like Elite Dangerous is uh, pretty popular. I should take a look at it. I wonder if it'll do for me what I was kind of hoping Dual Universe would do. Um, we'll see. Maybe. I think the other part of it uh, is just when you sort of announce, you know, how much money you have, it also st- starts to look bad, right? So so when you have like a Star Citizen saying, we have $125 million, come buy this $100 ship that may or may not come. When you have, you know, Steven saying, I have, I have money to fund all of this, all of my own. Um, come by this Funko um, Pop figure. It just, I think people see that and they get kind of, uh, some people okay, get turned but, off. But but I well, think the difference for me is that Star Citizen stuff 
was like hella expensive. And so far, the Ashes of Creation merch has been pretty reasonable. Um, and again, I like I like uh, play Doctor Masks, so I would just buy a plushie of a something that a Plague Doctor. You know what Masks. would be interesting if we go all the way back, and I, I don't know how we would find this if it's on the way back machine. If you look back through all of their the store offerings and when it's changed. What would you have spent if you have bought everything each time? I'm, I'm curious how much that would be. Because we know there are wells, right? That was, that was Illyria's problem. Um, it, it was, I, see, I see that different. It wasn't because they had $120 million and they just pissed it all away. It's be, I think Illyria's problem was, one, they didn't have enough, and two, that what they did have came from a very small subset of humongous whales who had a lot of people following them and became very vocal when, you know, they're literally, I mean, what's the highest side of their view? I mean, I think I've like 50 grand, 60 grand um, put in by individual players. I mean, possibly more. They yeah. possibly never wanted to mention exactly how yeah, much. They so, put in. so I see that a little bit different. Um, but anyways, um, but similar in that, hey. they, you know, offering things before you have a game. I remember Stephen saying at some point, essentially, I've got the, the funds myself committed to build the entire damn project, regardless of uh, backers and everything. But this isn't just a vanity project. This is a project that's meant to be uh, vi market viable and self-sustainable going into the future. So uh, I, I think he's trying to get people a little bit more used to paying for the stuff, doing the thing with the FOMO exclusives, because that's also another thing that he, he absolutely loves is making things exclusive for limited periods of time and then just they're gone. And that's that was the only time you could get them. I do like that that's a little bit um, uh, uh, watered down by the fact that you can get all of those pieces in the game piecemeal and potentially dye them to be the other way. So the... Uh, the, the Sufferton Bear, there will be some catchable version of the Sufferton Bear in the game. Might not look exactly the same, but you could probably get it looking pretty similar with the die, or it looks similar enough that you can just roll with it as is. Um, I think they... I have to be brown, but I'm getting one. I have to have one. I'm a Care Bear. I gotta be I riding on a Care Bear mount. I would imagine a plaid one would be a little bit more like striking and more your style. So, you know, be on the lookout for sure. Mm -hmm. Where they exist in the game, I don't know. That still seems like some, like, magic dungeon, or maybe that's one of the iterations of corruption is, like, a cute and playful version instead of, you know, guts falling out and the innards all, like, you know, gooey and melty that you've got things that look like they've been made into dolls and into toys um, and stuff. You'll probably find them somewhere in between Mount Doom and Hogwarts. <laughs> that's that's my guess somewhere in there I well thought, we're both in england so uh <clears throat> i thought there was a mention that one of the biomes is going to be a magic biome uh, could be um, i don't actually remember that anybody in chat i'll see if i can find it on the uh, wiki a land of whimsy and that's still the thing that that i just I don't know. I'm, I hope they're they're artists, they're they're world creators. I, I'm I am very curious to see how they creatively blend the mesh of skins that they have currently allowed us to purchase into one uh, semi normal looking world. <laughs> um, it'll be interesting. Actually, with um, with with freeholds, we we know the space of a freehold. Do we? Uh, do we know exactly how far in between each freehold? Like, or if there's clusters or... Um, no. Okay, so we don't know if it's like going to be one cluster, you know, city of freeholds, or if it's just going to be freeholds scattered throughout the, you know, with space in between. I think it's going to be some amount of scattered throughout, but I also believe that's part of what the mayor gets to do is kind of allocate the plots and lands for the different stuff. I did see a post on Reddit from one of the people who became mayor and was able to access some of the basic mayoral tools that exist. So uh, it, it definitely sounds like there's some amount of 
you get to a certain tier and some things automatically pop into place and then where things haven't automatically popped into place is where you can really set things down in different ways yeah so there's magical seasons and then there may be ley lines and strong magical places in the world that change or alter the way spells work um so at least i don't know may, maybe during a magical season somewhere is when you can find the maybe, stuff happens. maybe there's a polymorph storm or something and that's where you find them um well supposedly they came from you know a wizard who wanted that type of mount which makes sense to me could have created a whole bunch of them assembly line yep yeah that does make sense well, we're getting towards the end of our time. Anything else that you all have read about or saw on Twitter, Reddit, uh, forums, anything to kind of talk about? There was a forum post of someone requesting an alpha key, even placed <laughs> their their uh, computer specs on there. Um, yeah, I, I saw somebody who said they just quit their job, so they have time. I'm like, what? That's uh, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. for that. You'll get, what, four tests in, maybe? Mm -hmm. um, actually, I think there's more than four. If I remember the schedule, there might be more than four between now and July 9th. But, um, and we'll see if July 9th even keeps. You know, that's right. I think the thing that they're really trying to do is get everything in shape enough so July 9th is actually worth bringing in a lot more people and allowing people to stream. But... It is absolutely not out of the question. It is definitely possible that they will continue to delay it. Uh, I haven't checked recently, but the last time I looked, I'm just going to look on the career page now. Uh, if they've even filled in any of the uh, the new networking spots, I feel like they talked about it a little bit on the uh, last live stream. But they're still looking for build an integration engineer and Unreal Network Engineer. Uh, cloud security engineer, network administrator. Um, the fact that those are still listed as jobs that they're hiring for indicates to me that they're still trying to get the right person or the right people for each of those roles. And then once they have those people, even if they're kind of slow to put, you know, take the roles off the website there, um, there's going to be some ramp up time getting people involved and used to the project and, you know, understanding the ins and outs of what they've done. From what I understand, Unreal Engine is generally not the most advised for MMOs that, you know, your under 28 versus 128 is kind of pushing it a little bit, for example. But uh, I believe other games have done MMOs successfully on um, Unreal Engines. I know DCUO, uh, probably in its prime, it was it was doing all right on Unreal 3. So you would hope Unreal 4 would be better. Maybe they're even, uh, you know, with the switch to Unreal 5 on the horizon. Um, uh, maybe there's more networking stuff there and more uh, performance oriented stuff. But I, I don't think that's going to manifest for any anytime soon because that's still just kind of coming out and being available to people. Um, what did you uh, do this week? Did you get to play Thursday? Yeah. What and it was, Thursday? um, did the, uh, crypt quest one more time. Both quest givers are broken. So just don't do the crypt quest. Do the cave quest. You got a hundred gold from the flower vendor. As soon as you've got both, uh, NPCs located, just control T. It'll teleport you right back to the camp so you can turn it in. And use that run bonus to start going directly east. You want to go all the way east to the teleporter uh, on the coast. Once you go across, you go to the, um, the the dude in the tent with the map stuff. Talk to him. You talk to all of his apprentices. You talk to him again. You do the little walk around to get the compass. And then you move on to do the part where you answer his questions. And by the time you're done with that, you're, you're level six or at least pretty well close at that point. So um, for anybody that, that's watching, you can feel free to take notes. The answers for the coordinates quests are, the first version of it is the second answer. The second round of it is the first answer and then the first answer again. The third round of it is the third answer, 
the second answer, the first answer. The fourth round of it is the second answer, the third answer, the first answer, and the third answer. And I'll post that in chat here too. So if anybody didn't quite get all that down, because it's really just the fastest way to get to level five. You just do basically the cave, you, you kill the animated armor, you do the cave quest, you go out with that run bonus to talk to the mappy dude. And then, you know, because you got that hundred gold, as soon as you're at that point, find a vendor with a spear, get to killing. Because that's most of what the the rest of it is. We tried to take down the um, the the double um, ancients bosses, where there's the the one who sunders the land and the one that you know tears the sky or whatever. And we just got absolutely smashed because we were using default gear and we had really leveled up more than about five or six. So then we went to go try to track down this quest giver I, I found named Zandelv the Wandering or something, who's basically in the northwest uh, corner of the roads, the, the most northwestern road where it kind of goes up and then goes right and makes more of a corner. You'll find him patrolling around there, but you won't find him if it's a level zero node, it turns out. So we went there, we searched around, dude didn't show up, we didn't get to kill him. You can take quests or you can try to fight him. And so we then went and tried to fight the dragon. And they said, oh, oh, the ice dragon's so easy. Like three clerics can kill it, no problem. No, they actually got the real version of the ice dragon in and it really destroyed us. And that was basically what we got in for the test. Nice. Not yeah, I think me, it wasn't but the anyway. people I was playing with. Right, right, right. I, uh, I think um, there wasn't a lot of time. Was it just three hours? Um, uh, was it two to five, two to six, something like that? Something like that. There were only a few yeah. hours for this one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just ran around. You know, uh, one thing that I really loved with this last test, for some reason, um, normally when I've been playing and I go to the cave, I end up uh, running up from the back of the cave and then going around to the front. This time, somehow I ended up um seeing the front of the cave from a distance and that was really cool to be super far away and then catch it oh that's the cave way over there and just you know we know we can see that with the mountains pretty much if you can see it you're going to be able to find a way to get over there and and you know unless you run into the corruption wall um so it was really cool to be running and see the cave in a distance and know Hey, I probably want to go over there and be able to run straight up over there. Um, the last test from the previous week, um, when they kicked us out at the end, and they were still trying to do some siege testing. So they kicked, they supposedly were taking down the servers, but they left, I think, mine up so they could technically do some siege stuff with a few people. Um, so at that point, there were no uh mobs around um it was just empty so i could just explore as far as i wanted um and that was really cool just to be able to run around and again be able to um see points of interest like the big giant head that's just sitting out in the grasslands somewhere um normally i'd be taking some detours to avoid some uh, high level mobs, but this time I could just go anywhere I wanted, and that was kind of cool. I liked the exploration quite a bit more. Um, I mean, this, I mean, Steven likes, well, maybe because I'm not on 4K graphics. <laughs> so Steven likes to talk about how beautiful it is, and it's okay. I think I liked APOC better, actually. Um, but, uh, um, that time when there's no mobs and I could just run around freely exploring was pretty fun. I mean, it, gotcha. is, it is a beautiful game, but, you know, compared to modern games, it's kind of like all the others. I, I guess the unique part about it is it trying to do it as an MMO. Um, so. It, I think they're still targeting a graphics profile that includes as many people as possible rather than trying to push the graphics to the absolute furthest 
And that definitely makes sense because there's still a lot of MMO players that are only playing on like mid tier tech that can play WoW, for example, and they haven't upgraded their computer in a while. So it it makes sense that they're targeting a pretty looking game that supports a wide range of hardware. I've been playing with a, a 970 and a, a 3770K processor, not overclocking it, uh, and plenty of RAM, and the game runs just fine on low. I'd imagine if I set it to ultra, it'd still look just fine. But that's, you know, that's kind of old tech at this point. That's getting to be, um, you know, nine years on the most of the machine and then eight years on the graphics card. So that's that's still running it really well. It looks really good. Don't I don't feel like there's any limit to the experience. I don't think like anything is being cold or being um, cut off by like fog or mist or anything in a way that's trying to reduce performance. But instead, they've developed it in a very high performance sort of way that allows for people with even mid to low tier hardware can see all the way off in the distance and it doesn't kill their machine. Uh, speaking of graphics, what do you guys think about the uh, all the special effects? There was a post, I guess, probably around Monday, Sunday or Monday, about um, uh, the rainbow effects on hallowed ground being way too much, especially when uh, there's so many of them played. So the, you know, there's the area of effect that's gold on the ground, but then there's a bubble of rainbow, um, you know, uh, surrounding that. And they said in the sieges, it's too much. Um, have you done enough group combat to know whether or not the special effects are too high? These devs seem to love a lot of sparkles. So <laughs> everything's still being tuned right now is what I'm going to say. Nothing, it, it, nothing it is finished. Be. But but they tend to like sparkles. So I think we're going to see a bunch of sparkles, and then well, you're going to have to turn them tune them down. But for you uh, and your taste, where are they right now? Are they are they annoying? They're or? playable. They're pretty playable right now. I think back to the early days of Warframe, where even setting your graphics to like a lower particle effect, everything was just bright splashes everywhere, and was just completely occluding your vision in the middle of the battle you couldn't you couldn't really tell where everything was at it was just like well i think there's an enemy there so i'm going to shoot that way or oh there's probably an enemy there i'm just going to rush that direction and start swinging and if i don't hit anything i'll keep going a little further that um they have done a great job of really tuning down the effects and everything i i think also back to the idea of when um uh, Nvidia PhysX came in and everyone wanted to use PhysX and it's like great so you've got these particles that have like a magnetic effect so when you get close to them they swirl around you it's oh so cool it's like yeah it's cool that it can do that but you don't necessarily need every freaking thing in the game to do that so you know all the balancing it's going to take some time it's going to take some effort um, a lot of this stuff is probably, you know, affecting the lifetime of the particles, the translucency of them, uh, groupings of them, and that sort of stuff. But so far, I haven't had any trouble spotting the things I'm trying to fight, spotting my allies in the battle. Um, not, not really any limits for me based on, you know, graphic overload or anything. And then what about the uh, animations? Uh... A couple of animations got nerfed. Hallowed Ground was one of them. Um, Fireball was another. Uh, they originally had levitation, levitating up in the air, and the Fireball one had levitating and then doing a wind-up spin to throw, and people felt that was way too over-the-top. They don't want over-the-top animations. A lot of people I mean, just want realistic, grounded, <laughs> grounded. But for me, I like the anime. Um, animations it's high fantasy and you know especially as telegraphs those are great for me i, I like to have telegraphs those are going to help me see what uh and anticipate what my team members are using and give me time to you know support them accordingly like an rpg so i like that stuff but 
there's always a give and a take like the fireball letting you kind of vault in the air while you aim it that means you're maybe a little bit easier for ranged attackers to attack but ground attackers will have a much harder time hitting you uh it means there's a higher chance you might get interrupted by uh, a cc effect like a javelin pulling you in because i don't know if that would pull you down to the floor and cancel your spell or not um, but also it would give you potentially the ability to evade um, surface level CCs and surface level AOEs and stuff because you're in the air and they do an earthquake and you're just like, ha ha, I'm in the air, screw you. So I, I understand why they want to keep things a little more level. And ultimately, since you can adjust the angle of your camera and the zoom of the camera to a, a pretty decent extent, I think people that want to be able to have that higher up view to target things will be able to do that simply by manipulating their camera rather than um, it being a very like over the shoulder type third person view where you just don't have the view of everyone on the battlefield because that's that's kind of crappy for something where you've got a large amount of fighters in a large area and you've got AOEs you're trying to hit with. Well, Theater L says that she's glad they cut out the um the levitation but so my question is like do you uh prefer the over the top uh, again for me it's a high level fan it's a um it's a high fantasy magic so i like glowy stuff and stuff like that it's gonna I like it as an augment i'll say that i like the idea that any form of ranged attack could potentially be augmented for a jump and float in the air while you aim and hit with it sort of thing that definitely makes sense to me but having it built in as a default effect not exactly like maybe if it's your your class ultimate ability or something like that that yeah. i could see something being that over the top they said they're saving that animation for later uh iteration so maybe a rank up or um some higher level power that you get at a later level um i think but um yeah, okay. I'm just wondering. Lots of lots of people want it to be more um I guess they want it to be low magic versus high magic. But it's I mean high magic. I just try to imagine having five, you know, two two fifty V two fifty and having all of this shit going on around. It's just you know, I, I I've said similar to the UI, because this is in a way similar well, kind of somewhat similar to like uh quest finding or you know, um Ad, not add-ons because we don't have add-ons, but sparklies and shinies. So, some way to turn off, you know, particle effects. Now, the, the only thing, obviously, I, you wouldn't want to do that if there's certain moves that, in combat, the only way you know what's coming is through the particle effects. You know, then, then that obviously would not end up very good. Um, so maybe if there was some other way to identify skills as they're being done, but. Uh, my, my I mean, translucent would, orbs and discs would work. Um, but, yeah, I mean, again, in, in, in Valheim, uh, one of the things I love is um, when the, uh, is it the druids that rear back right before they're going to uh, hit you and then I throw up my shield and they bounce off of it? I love all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's just... I don't know. I just, I'm not a big... I don't like lots of big shiny stuff flying everywhere. Um, you know, I don't even like the idea of, of you know, the, the little circles or reticles of, of bosses and showing you where to stand and where to not stand. I would much rather it be an actual animation of some sort that I can tell is coming towards me. Now, some degree of effect, sure. Um, I think that's fine. And the Ice Dragon has that pretty much down, though, is that it isn't here's an area, jump out of it. It's, you know, here's this ice effect. It actually looks thematic. It's not just some default, um, you know, tell for where it's going to go. It doesn't tell you exactly when it's going to detonate. You have to actually practice and fight it a few times to really get the rhythm down. So yeah. it's not it's not like um, Wild Star or I want to say Blade and Soul also had that level of anticipates in it. I mean, just imagine the frustration you would have as a PvP player. You're right there at the throne and you lost because they decided to spam, you know, 2,000 different um, sunbeams or something that com completely occluding your view of what you were trying to do. Um, 
sort of the particle equivalent of stun lock that Steven had when he got killed. So. I'm the king. <laughs> well, we are at the end of our time. So um, we'll be back next Sunday, I guess. There's still loads of stuff to talk about. So, um, um, I want to mention Paleo, just Paleo. We might need to start something up with that coming yeah. soon. We'll have to check it out. Yeah, I mean, we, we certainly can talk about that. That's um, That seems more up my sort of style of play, so um, I haven't read too much on it this at this point, though. I just saw that initial tweet that blew up everywhere. Well, all right, everyone have a great week, and we will see you next Sunday. Hey, later, everybody.